Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon and, and welcome. I'm Maureen Conway and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's event, Beyond Great Places to Work, the business case for investing in frontline workers. Um, we're delighted to have you here today at our Working in America series. The Working in America series is an ongoing discussion series that highlights an array of critical employment and job quality issues for low and moderate in income Americans today. Um, well, we've seen job growth and, uh, lately. It's still not enough jobs for people who need them, and also the quality of jobs are, are often insufficient to help people make ends meet in today's economy. Unemployment and underemployment remain troubling. Uh, so too many working Americans struggle uh, to make ends meet based on their work. And in this series, we confront this difficult issue and try to surface solutions and ideas to address it. Um, we are very grateful for the support of the Ford Foundation, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, and the, the Serdina Foundation, and the Hitachi Foundation for, uh, for working with us on this series. And I'm particularly pleased to welcome our colleagues from the Hitachi Foundation to the series today. They've uh, worked with us on um, the design of today's event. And so I will introduce now Mark Popovich from the Hitachi Foundation. He's a vice president of programs at the Hitachi Foundation, where he leads the team managing good companies at work. Uh, the program emphasizes the role of business in society and the importance of social sustainability. And um, I've known Mark for a really long time, uh, but we agreed we wouldn't count exactly how many years it was earlier today. So, but Mark has just uh, been a wonderful colleague for the economic opportunities programs for many years. He's been a terrific thought partner for us in a variety of our work. And we're really pleased to have uh, Mark here with us to uh, launch today's event, so. Thank you, Maureen. Um, Thank you all for coming. Uh, we're really pleased to be here today, in part because for a number of years, we've been consumers of these kinds of series and consumers of a lot of what Maureen and her colleagues have done in the economic opportunities programs and in some of the other areas of the, of the Aspen Institute in terms of the work that they've done. We've also more recently become a contributor in terms of giving financial support for the seminar series. And we finally got into the third C where we're providing some content as well. And we're hoping the third C goes as well as the, uh, the two C's before that have done. Um, I don't know how many of you know the Hitachi Foundation very well. Raise your hand if you think you know us reasonably well. That's pretty good. We have some friends and colleagues here who are recognized in the audience. and. Uh, I'm sure that our communications team will be happy that we had that number who already know us. I just want to introduce one of the members of the team, Laura Faulkner. Jeff White uh, heads that team. Um, so let me just say a couple of things for those that don't. Uh, Mention Barbara Dyer, our president and CEO, who really is over and uh, the moving spirit behind all the work we do. She's the president and CEO of the foundation, um, has been there uh, for, uh, for many years, is only the second president of the foundation. Um, we're not a corporate foundation in the traditional sense in that we were set up as an independent 501c3 with an American board, and we're focused only in the United States. Um, for the last 12 years or so, we focused on a particular niche due to our limited size and asset base and our limited staff. Our niche has been on the role of business and society and where that intersects on the potential for better outcomes for low income, low asset individuals in the United States. And where we've decided over time that the biggest leverage point would be that we would focus on is the role of, of business as an employer. Now there are many, many, far too many businesses who are not good employers. But we decided on a strategy because we had seen many employers who were good employers and were investing in a way that resulted in the business doing well, the employees progressing, uh, becoming higher earning, and it worked out for the business, for the employees, for the communities, and for our economy as a whole. Now that kind of work uh, was driven by a research strategy called the positive deviant research, active research strategy, because if you're gonna be a deviant, you should be a positive deviant. <laughs> and in fact, it had been originally, um, uh, as an as a, as a approach to research, had been pioneered in international health, where you had very little time, very little resources to try to get really good outcomes for people who were in really bad conditions. So we applied that and began a search 
for, you begin positive deviance by searching for the outcomes that you want, not the strategy that you think works. So you go and you look in this case for businesses in two sectors, manufacturing and health, that had really great outcomes for frontline lower wage workers, meaning like 10, 20, 50% increases in wages and earnings, career advancement that lasted, high retention rates, better job satisfaction. And it worked out for the business in a way that was really sustainable and where another business would say, as you'll see talking to some of these employers today, I want to be like them because that's a very successful business. So we developed working with our colleagues in a number of organizations about 100 business cases. And from those business cases, we came, so we found it was pretty easy to find businesses who did these good things. And we wanted to look at their strategies. And in the beginning, when we started this work, we had an assumption, an idea about what made a difference. And what we assumed was the case is that innovations in human capital made the difference. Training, the way you deployed people, the way you trained them, the way you supported them, the way you supervised them. I'm not saying that's unimportant, but what we found is that's the, that's the follower, not the driver. We looked across all these 100 businesses in two different sectors, and what we found is it was really driven by innovation in these two spheres first. It was innovation in products and services, innovation in method and means, and that resulted in driving human capital, human resources, policies, and practices. And then when those overlapped, that's where we got the biggest lift for the business, the biggest lift for the employees, and the biggest lift for the community as a whole. That was the sustainable, virtual, virtuous model. So let me introduce the, the, the video, the, the Union Health uh, Clinics video. And when you see a video about healthcare, you don't think about it as an employer and a bunch of employees. You think about it as a human serv services. You think about quality of care. And all of those are demonstrated in this model. But I want you to step back and think about those three spheres of innovation that we talked about. They were innovative in the product or service that they did. They really changed the way that they did primary care for pretty sick patients. They, for chronically ill patients, they substantially changed the way, what they were doing. They changed the way they were doing it. They did team-based patient-centered care. And they had to support people in a way to do that. So they did training, they did advancement, they did job ladders. And they did pay increases. The one thing you won't see in this video, because it's designed for health clinic and hospital administrators. Is any, are all of you hospital administrators and health clinic managers? OK, this wasn't designed for you, but we're showing it anyway. Um, is when people entered training for this job ladder, they went from an entry level to a 12% increase in their hourly wage. When they completed the training, which was in about a year, they got a 20% increase. That's total, 12 plus 8. And if they went to the next run, which was health coach, you'll see health coaches, they got another, they, that was health coach. And if they went to floor coordinator, that was another 27%. So 47% increase in earnings over a couple of years of work and in the job ladder. We're going to have a tremendous increase in the number of people working in the front line of, work, of health care. Those front line jobs are really poor paying and poor opportunities for advancement. This is a model we're about to show you uh, where there's much better outcomes. And I hope we can do that for patients, for our employees in the front lines of health care, and for the clinics themselves. So. mother 50 years ago they told her she was diabetic he had a prescription she walked out the door my mother never learned how to take care of herself my mother didn't know what to eat and because of that lack of education she lived through the complications of diabetes to educate patients and to work one-on-one -on -one with the patient that is beyond rewarding my name is Iris Leon, and I'm a registered nurse at Union Health Center. The Union Health Center started in 1914 to take care of the garment workers who were faced with an epidemic of tuberculosis. 
today, patients are union members of many different unions. Laundry workers, porters, housekeeping services, um, doormen. But the mission of the Union Health Center has always been the same, to take care of low-wage immigrant working people. Prior to 2005, providers were always responsible for educating patients and taking care of the patients, and it was just too time-consuming for them. We had to change somehow. The traditional model of healthcare is just something that providers can't do alone. A patient medical home is not only a place where patients come when they're just sick, but it's a place where they can learn and get educated on how to take care of themselves. I've been an RN for 36 years, and uh, I've had vast experience in uh, nursing, administration, as well as education. What I've learned being here, it's a different approach to health care. These patients have to be involved and educated in taking care of themselves, and the staff needs to be able to provide that education. So in order for them to do that, they have to be trained on an ongoing basis. That is so important. During this time, the providers, the medical assistants, the RN, the supportive staff, we meet and we discuss issues and problems that have come up and we troubleshoot. And then the following week, there's team training where they go through a curriculum. We actually ask the providers, really, what do you want your patients leaving the health center to take with them and how do you want them to learn it? I know a lot of people would say we just have to keep working, we have to see patients, you know, like seven, eight hours a day. But the protected time really pays off at the end because that's the only way you're going to be able to have your medical assistants become skilled in things that they didn't learn prior to coming into this position. To be honest with you, I was resistant to the idea of taking the traditional role of the medical assistant and making it a little bit more than I thought it should be. Well, after all the training, I was able to honestly feel that it could be done. I don't think that I would have gotten to be an RN if it wasn't because I got that training. I believe that the protective time here has made such a huge difference in um, building the medical home teams. It allowed us a lot of time to learn and also now I feel there's better communication between the team, between the medical assistant, the provider, the health coaches, the patient support staff. They're able to communicate much better. Support is a very important piece of working in healthcare and knowing that you have a team, um, so it's not just one individual but multiple people who are all geared toward the same goal makes a big difference in keeping your own motivation up. And I think that what I found the most amazing is that not only are there people dedicated to doing this, but they are showing that they can have good outcomes. and this, you're not gonna do it because it's not what you wanna do. You have to allow the patients, just like you have to allow the staff, to take charge. That's what this is all about. Great. Well, I think that was really helpful to, uh, you know, set the tone. And I want to thank um, the Hitachi Foundation and, and recognize uh, Tom Strong in particular, who uh, managed the production of that video. So I want to thank the Hitachi Foundation for uh, the video and for all their work on this. And encourage you to also visit that website where you can see more and uh, 
from their practice library and see their report called Doing Well, Doing Good. Doing well, doing good. And now it is my great pleasure to very quickly introduce our panel for you. Um, uh, you have materials uh, on your chairs with their bios, so um, you can see how impressive they are. I won't read those to you. I will just quickly kind of put names to faces. So right next to me is Drew Greenblatt, who is president of Marlin Steel. Uh, next to Drew is Kelly Wolski, senior trainer for Zappos Insight. Uh, next to Kelly, we have uh, David Owen, who is primary care medical director of South Jordan Health Center. And we're delighted to have Stephen Perlstein as our moderator today, who's columnist, professor, and all-around knowledgeable person of lots of things with business <laughs> and economics. So thank you very much, Stephen, for being here, and take it away. Thank you very much, and welcome. Um, if some of you who can't see me, uh, if I can't see you, it's probably true that you can't see me. If you want to come up to some chairs here, and if there are some people who can't see uh, Drew, uh, uh, Drew over there, you might want to uh, move your seats. This, there are seats where you can see everybody. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, start with a softball question for each of, uh, of you um, and start with uh, Drew. Drew, I'm going to read something that you wrote. When I bought the company, that's Marlin Steel, everyone was earning minimum wage and I was the only one who owned a home or a car. There used to be no cars in the parking lot and I could park wherever I wanted. Now, more than half of the employees own a home, 100% own one or even two cars, and the parking lot has cars double or triple parked. I like it when people complain about all the cars in the parking lot because it means they're all successful. So, um, David, uh, how come, how have you been able to uh, to be such a boon to the auto industry. <laughs> we have great people. And great people are what makes our company thrive and prosper. They come up with innovative ideas. Uh, they think outside the box. They're dedicated to making sure the clients are happy. And uh, there's a classic, it's a classic case of what goes around comes around. And if you compensate your people well, if you give them very objective targets of what we're trying to accomplish uh, and you give them the tools to be effective, uh, they're going to do wonderful things. You just got to get out of their way. And my job is to hire great talent, give them very clear goals, and uh, get the heck out of the way. So you've obviously, though, if they can now afford houses and cars, um, you've obviously changed the work that they do. Um, uh, so that it is it is a higher value added work and so you can afford to pay them more. Absolutely. So how did you do that? Absolutely. So when I first bought the company, uh, we were in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, everybody, we made bagel baskets. And every bagel basket was made by hand. So literally people would take their arm and they would bend a wire one at a time to make the frames of a basket or they would weld a basket one at a time. Uh, it was right out of a Dickens novel. That's the company I bought. And we had two people missing eyes. We had two people missing fingers. Uh, it was a very different kind of company. Everybody was minimum wage. The health insurance plan was you go to the emergency room. Um, so uh, fast forward, we've reinvested a tremendous amount of money into the company. We've put over $4 million into new technology, new robots. And what's happened is, is because we have this new technology, our employees are much safer. Uh, they're outside the cage where the robot does the, the bending, and they're doing more interesting work. They're monitoring a series of robots, uh, and the quality's much better. We're shipping much faster, and we're able to be more competitive with com countries like China and uh, Mexico. And you've moved well beyond bagels. Absolutely. So now bagels are less than 1% of our sales. And uh, over 99% of our sales are to clients like Merck and Pfizer and Boeing and Caterpillar. So we've migrated away from commodity bagel baskets into uh, precision engineered products. Um, and uh, with the use of this technology and the great talent, we've really thrived and, and uh, the employees are paid uh, you know, between anywhere from you know, 50 to 100 something grand a year on the factory floor. That's great, okay. David, uh, story. Um, uh, I recently um, 
had problems with my Achilles tendon and I had to um, basically get it operated on. And so I went to um, a local hospital, which will remain unnamed, uh, <laughs> to see a specialist, an orthopedic specialist who specializes in ankles. And uh, so I go into the first time I get go into the orthopedic office there, uh, I opened the door and I knew I was in trouble because there were about as many people in the waiting room as there are over there. Uh, and the, uh, they were all there. Uh, and then over here was the desk. Uh, and, and behind the desk there were uh, all women. Uh, and then they were in uniforms, blue uniforms, and there were about eight of them. And they were doing nothing. They were talking to each other. So, uh, and I go up, and so then one of them hands me the thing and fill out these eight forms. And in the eight forms, I had to repeat, in, in, in their own eight forms, I had to repeat the same information many times. Um, and then it turns out that they already had that because I'd been at Georgetown before. <laughs> And anyway, they already had most of it anyway. But so I'm finished, and uh, and then I sit there and I wait for for uh, a long time past my uh, thing, and and no one ever comes to me and says, well, here's what the problem is, you know, here's why we're making you wait. Finally, um, I get showed into a room where I wait another half an hour by someone who didn't say anything to me, uh, didn't ask me what was wrong, what I needed, or nothing like that. Then the doctor comes in for 5.5 minutes. Uh, looks at me and says, you know, you need this test and this MRI and then come back. So I go out and uh, to the, about the six or seven ladies and they say, okay, I need you to help me get, you know, the MRI and the this. And they say, well, we don't do that. And I said, well, <laughs> well what do you mean? It's a, big, it's a big hospital. Don't you have an MRI machine? And they, oh, yeah, we have. But you have to go to those offices and make your appointments yourself. And then when you finish with that, then you call us back and then you make an appointment to come back and see the doctor. Uh, which, of course, as you can imagine, that was going to be three days. Anyway, that was my last visit because I, I never did that. I went to another place, uh, much more expensive, and uh, got it done. Uh, it all worked out very well. I'm back playing tennis. But I, I do that as a setup for you because this is, uh, tell me what you've done so that people who go uh, to South Jordan Health don't have the same experience that I had. Well, first of all, I'm sorry to hear about uh, <laughs> what happened to you. And, and unfortunately, that is a fairly typical experience, I think, in healthcare today. Uh, there's a lot of inefficiency, there's a lot of waste, and uh, it, it's expensive for the patients in time and money, but it's also expensive for the healthcare system, too. And we ran up against that uh, at South Jordan and in the University of Utah's community clinics where I work because they were uh, mismanaged when we first started getting into this business. Just going back a little bit to uh, the year 2000, uh, the University of Utah decided that it needed to have a network of outpatient clinics in order to have a referral stream for the specialists up on the hill, the, the University of Utah campus where the specialty hospital was. We didn't have anything like that. And so we bought a group of clinics from FHP, who used to be in our market and no longer is, but we didn't know how to run them. And so the first year we were open in 2000, we lost $20 million due to inefficiencies like what you just described. And all of a sudden we decided, this isn't gonna work. We're gonna have to make some major changes. And so what we did to try and improve things is uh, something that I thought was very refreshing for an academic medical center. They built uh, what they called the beta site, which was a test clinic. It, it had two primary care physicians in it, and I was one of the two. They gave us a lot of leeway to make changes and to try experimental things that were outside of the box that were different, hopefully, from the model that was existing previously. And we looked at outside research, what others had done. We had patient surveys. Um, we had patient focus groups and provider focus groups to come up with the ideas that we tested. And what we ended up coming up with was a very expanded role for the medical assistants. They uh, were given the flexibility to do multiple tasks. And so, for example, in the example you described, how you had to go to the other department and wait there to schedule an appointment, we tried to free up the medical assistants to have roles of scheduling. Um, they could do everything that the front office could do. Uh, they were trained to be limited rad techs so that they could even just walk patients over to x-ray and take uh, simple x-rays. 
they were given the freedom to do phlebotomy, blood draws just right there in the room to try and bring all the services to the patient in the room where they were being seen when they were ready to receive them so that they didn't have to go from place to place to place throughout the clinic to have things done in an inefficient manner. Okay, thanks. Kelly, um, at Zappos where um, you work, I'm told it cost $50,000 to recruit, hire, and then train every new employee on average. That sounds like a lot of money, um, particularly reference to probably what the average paid, what the average pay of your employees, which is you know not the highest in the world. Right. Um, so explain to me why you would spend that much money. Uh, well, it's really important to us to kind of really load that at the front, to kind of front load that that investment, and, and it really I think speaks to the the view of investing in employees. I mean, we're talking real money here. Um, and that, that recruiting process is pretty rigorous. Statistically, if you know if you buy into statistics, it's more difficult to get hired at Zappos than it is to get into Harvard. Um, <clears throat> statistically, okay, we don't have, <laughs> clearly we don't have the same SAT requirements, or there's no, well, there, there is an essay actually, so maybe that's part of it. Um, there is an essay? Yes, but it is, it is a long process, and, and it, it's that important to us, I think, that we keep then the turnover and engagement um, low and high, respectively. So what is the turnover? Um, our annual turnover averages around 20%, which is not really where we'd like it to be. Um, we've This year we're on target to be around 16%, and really between that, and it's somewhere in the middle teens, around 15% is for us, I think, a healthy churn if you consider our industry. It's retail, it's also a little bit of technology, um, so if we can keep a healthy churn there. We're getting a, enough new ideas in, um, and we're also moving people through our pipeline. And where, does it, does most of the expense come in the uh, the recruitment process? I would say it's split with recruiting and then training. Our onboarding is four weeks. Four weeks. Yeah. So so it's and, and how many weeks is it to do for the process for selection? Uh, about it's the uh, average is twelve weeks um, from from um, initial application date to start date. So 16 weeks, almost four months goes by before, between you know, initial application and when someone starts a job, which could be being an, uh, at the other end of the phone on fulfillment. And if they're, if they're working in the customer loyalty team doing that, that, that kind of customer service job, there's an additional three weeks after that. Okay, so that's a, that's a big investment. Um, so uh, let's talk about training. I'm going to ask you each to talk about uh, trainings in a couple of minutes. Tell us what are some of the interesting or unique things about um, your training, uh, how, you, how you do your training, um, and, and why it's different than others in your industry. Why don't you start, Dave? Okay. So when we bring on new medical assistants, they've, uh, they've been trained already in medical assistant school, and they have a fair number of clinical skills. But then to work within our model, they need additional training. One of the things that sets us apart, I think, from uh, maybe a more standard model, I would say, is that the medical assistants participate in the documentation uh, in the chart. They participate more in the care of the patient than would normally be the case. I started out working in, in a standard model, and I had uh, a medical assistant who worked with me, and she was great. She knew everything about my preferences and my tendencies, and she could, she could anticipate when I was going to make mistakes and try and correct that. And so she was, she was fabulous to work with. But when she would get tied up, like when she was on the phone with somebody or when a complicated patient was being checked in, it would bottleneck the whole process, and uh, we couldn't move forward. And so we decided that in our training, we wanted to try and prevent that. And so we've trained our medical assistants to work together as teams. And they're not paired one to one with a provider, like used to be the case for me. So if someone gets tied up, the next MA just brings the next patient back. And <coughs> care keeps happening to help so that you don't have to wait in the lobby for an hour, like uh, used to be the case. And does that assistant basically stay with the patient from when they if not arrive, uh, at least get back into the offices and when they leave? That's true. And um, they weren't used to that. And so a lot of the stuff that they do required additional training. 
So when they bring the patient back, they take the vitals like used to be the case, but then they go through a history of present illness questionnaire with the patients, and they didn't know how to do that. But the questionnaires are all standardized and designed by physicians. So if someone comes in for abdominal pain, uh, the MA goes through all these questions for abdominal pain, all the things that the provider has to know, like when did it start, where is it, do you have a fever, have you had vomiting, have you been exposed to Ebola, you know, all those different kinds of things. Uh, and then when I go in, I can just sit down and say, so tell me about your abdominal pain. And I don't have to interrupt them every time I think that they're missing stuff that I have to know. So we had to train them how to do that. Uh, we had to train them how to prioritize things because sometimes the patient pulls out a list of like 30 things and somehow the MA has to sort out what are the real important things, what are the less important things, what just needs refills to kind of triage the process of the visit and set it up for me as a provider to make things more efficient when I go in there. Uh, I don't want to talk for 15 minutes uh, about their toenail if they're really concerned about their chest pain, for example. So it's important to make things efficient that way. So that, that required additional training for the MA. So they go through all that. Um, and then they shadow an MA who has been trained as a leader or as a trainer. They have a little bit more of an advanced position for four weeks. So th the two of them go in and go through this process every time a patient comes back for four weeks. And that's been very helpful for us too to solidify the things that they've learned. And then we also have a six month probationary period uh, because one of the things that we found is not everyone that comes out of MA school is qualified to do these additional tasks. Sometimes it's a little bit more challenging and, and we might move them to another area of the clinic where not so much is required of them. And so we have six months to figure that out and that, that's been very helpful as well. Okay, so Kelly, tell me about uh, all the, what do you do with these folks for all those uh, <laughs> weeks. Um, to, to give us some of the highlights. Sure. The four-week new hire training process um, everyone is something that everyone goes through. So if you're coming in to be a part of the customer loyalty team or even to be on our facilities team. Um, facilities your, team means you, the person that goes and gets the shoes or whatever. Oh, and, no. I okay. mean the person who fixes the light bulbs, that okay. kind of facility, okay. physical okay. plant. Because our fulfillment is handled by Amazon and it, it is in a separate location okay. now. Well, it is, it's in Kentucky. Um, <clears throat> so if you're going to be our new CTO, you're still in that class. Mm -hmm. um, there are heter heterogeneous classes. And we're talking about a couple of things. One is the big thing for us is really infusing the culture and having people go from an interest and maybe um, you know, uh, liking our core values, but understanding how we really operationalize our culture because that is, a, that is a huge thing for us. And when we're hiring people, part of the reason it takes 12 weeks is we're looking for people who are already aligned to those core values. But through the new hire training process, and we're very, very explicit to the point that as a trainer, I'm sometimes thinking, are you guys even like, you know, are you just so tired of hearing me say, well, we do this because of X. Um, we do that. And then the other half of it really is the nuts and bolts of customer service, because everything at the root of what we do is the belief that everyone has a customer. And you have internal customers and you have external customers. And we want employees to have great customer, a great customer experience as employees, just as we want our customers to have great experiences when they're purchasing, you know, shoes and handbags from our website. And it's something that you mentioned is just that when you treat people well, what happens is that that, that pours out from them and they pour it out in other things. And it's not a zero sum game for us. We, we really believe that we can make our customers happy and our investors and our vendors and our employees. So you, when you say well, I mean, one of the things that struck me is that if you take an employee to come into a, you know, let's just say a, a you, you call them customer loyalty, yes. but someone might call them, um, you know, a telephone fulfillment job, yeah, sure. um, which is not exactly the highest, you know, job on the ladder. But you want them to understand not just the nuts and bolts of the business, but you want them to understand the sort of the economics of the business, how this business works. Yes. And you treat them with a certain degree of respect. 
therefore, sort of an intellectual respect, and you hope that therefore that rubs off on their treatment of their cust of, of the outside customers. Absolutely. Um, Simon Sinek um, is a really um, someone that we admire a lot, and he has this whole TED Talk and book Start With Why, and then he talks about that golden, that golden circle, and it, when people understand why they're doing something, the what and the how are naturally going to, to, to fall into place. So we start with that very basic, this is why we're doing this, this is our goal, this is the purpose, this is why we're all here. And what we find is when we give them a lot of freedom with the what and the how, and it still works. Um, people are, because we're very transparent with our employees, and we're, we're just as transparent as we absolutely can be with even our customers and with the, with the world outside, um, the laws are a little bit different when it comes to outside the company, but because we're transparent, people feel a sense of ownership, and that's where that idea of empowerment comes from. I think that we use empowerment a lot in the business world, and what we really mean is authority. We want to give people the authority to solve the problems or carry out their responsibilities. That is not what empowerment is. Empowerment is when I feel like I have that authority to carry out those responsibilities. And you can't do that just by giving people authority. You also have to share with them that purpose and that bigger picture. So uh, Drew, tell us um, about the skills matrix. Skills matrix is a critical part of Marlon. <clears throat> what we do is we have in our lunchroom so everybody can see this, a huge Excel spreadsheet. And every column is every single one of the employees. And every row is every activity at the factory that is productive or that we need accomplished. So for example, setting up the laser. We have a laser in our factory. If you could set up the laser and you know how to do that, you get points for learning that skill. And if you know how to set up the punch, if you know how to set up the robotic wire forming machine, each of these is a different row, and you get points for learning more and more skills. The beauty of the skills matrix is multi-beneficial, uh, not only for the employee, but it's also good for our, the company, Marlin. Uh, the reason why it's good for the employee is because they have a clear path to know how to get ahead. It's a clear path. These are the skills that Marlin cares about. And anytime you learn one of these skills, you get paid more. So it's very uh, motivating to employees to get more skills because you get paid more. It's also motivating because your points are literally on the lunchroom wall. So there's a uh, incentive because you want to have a lot of points, okay? Because you have buddies in the company and you want to be one of the more astute people in the company. So a little healthy competition. It's a little healthy competition. The nice thing for Marlon is that we could see where our Achilles heel is because we really want to cross-train everybody in the company. Because we don't want to have everybody know the laser, but nobody knows the wireforming machines. Because our luck, next week we'll get a lot of wireforming work, we won't have any laser work, what are we going to do with our employees? So what happens is by everybody learning these skills and us seeing where our weaknesses are, so we can throw more talent to learn those skill sets that we're weak at, what happens is that we're, we're as a company we're more nimble. Our employees are more valuable because they're adaptable. So if we're buried with sheet metal work and laser work, well then we can pivot people over to that area and uh, the guys in the wire forming department won't be necessarily working in the wire forming department, they'll be working in the laser cell this week. So the idea is that everybody uh, gets a full paycheck every week, everybody's more valuable because they could be either a wire form person or a laser person and it's more engaging as, a, as an employee because you're doing different things you're not doing the same thing every single day okay so, so the skills matrix is intrinsic to our company so let's pivot now and why don't we stay with you Drew, since you talk about how compensation is done and how it's changed so one thing we know is that the more skills they get the higher their pay is, irrespective of whether they're using any particular skill at a particular time. Is there any other kinds of uh, wrinkles to your pay structure? A absolutely. And by the way, back to the skills matrix, the nice thing about it is it's a meritocracy, okay? Th there's no row there that says plays golf with owner or you know, drinks beer with plant manager, okay? So in a typical way, that's how you get ahead, okay? But with us, it's a clear objective meritocracy and we show what we care about on this document. Um, another important way we uh, 
are able to prosper and thrive at Marlin is that we have a very aggressive bonus program where most companies have employees that are blue collar, they punch in, they punch out, and they have very little skin in the game. We're the opposite. We have entrepreneurs in our company. Normally you have one entrepreneur and then you have everybody else that just wants to leave at five. Our company is unique in that we have everybody engaged because what we do is we have a very aggressive bonus program. We pay every two weeks, which is not too long. A lot of companies have you know, an annual target for a bonus. That's too long. Most people live paycheck to paycheck. They gotta pay for their rent. They gotta pay the car payment. They gotta pay for Timmy's braces. You know, they need a two weeks horizon. Okay, that's one benefit of the, our bonus program. Another one is we have it very micro. So all the guys in the laser cell have to hit a certain target. If they hit their number for their period, they get a big check. I'm talking about like $950 if they hit their number. The assistants get 350 bucks. That's a lot of money to a blue collar worker. And this is very motivating for the employees because when you're there, if you can hit your numbers, you get 950 bucks. So we used to have a whole layer of management that would walk around with clipboards and would wag your finger and say, you're taking too many bathroom breaks. Okay? You're talking about the Orioles too much. You're talking about the Ravens too much. That was their job, okay? counting up how many little widgets they made. Now that whole row is gone. That whole row of our management structure doesn't exist. Instead, we're paying these huge um, uh, bonuses to these people that now have skin in the game. They're mini entrepreneurs. They have a little shop. They're like shopkeepers. They care about their laser. They, they want to make sure that all the parts coming in and all the parts going out are going out in a timely basis in a good quality way. They ship a bad quality part. They don't get credit for that this week. So they have real skin in the game. And we treat them like adults. I mean, we're not walking around saying, hey, you went to the bathroom too often. So it's, it's a very productive, useful tool. And uh, we're able to ship faster because of that. And we have employees that are more engaged, more dedicated to the company. And on average, what percentage of total pay compensation comes in the form of these bonuses for, again, for a typical line worker? So we pay, every, we pay 26 pay periods a year, every two weeks. And uh, on average, it's about 14 pay periods a year uh, a, bo a bonus is awarded. Some cells do better. They're more aggressive. They're more hungry. They're in the 20 week, 20 pay period range. Others do less, 8 or 12 a year. So, but in terms of dollar amounts, it, it turns out to be anywhere between 10 and 50 percent of what their compensation is. In some, in some periods, if they do extraordinarily well, it could be 100 percent of their pay. Okay. So we have their engagement. We have their focus. And the thing that's wonderful that I didn't realize is everybody thinks I'm the boss. I'm not really the boss. Why? Because when the spouse sees that check, <laughs> they want to know, are you going to get your bonus this week? What happens is the family budget migrates up, including the new bonus check. So the spouse is kicking, you know, who in the butt, all right, to go get those laser cut parts off as fast as possible, okay? Because I want my 950 bucks. We can, we can do the car payment this month. Okay. So th this is sort of small. I just want to, because there's a lot of, in, in the compensation world, there's all sorts of disagreements about this. How much should be individual bonus, how much should be small group bonus, and how much should be company performance bonus. Right. You focus on the small group. Very micro because you can control micro. But not the individual, because you can't really determine, you know, within the, whatever you call it, the group, the uh, welding, Cells. the cell, within the welding cell, can you tell whether John is better than uh, Julie or? or so so we, do, we try to make the cells as micro as possible. So for example, we'll have sample makers that are solo. Okay. They have to hit 20 grand in the two week period. If they hit 20 grand, they get a bonus. Okay. If they hit 30 grand, they get a bigger bonus. Okay, if they hit 19 grand, they get zero. So they're very focused on hitting their 20 grand. Okay. So we'll have a single person in a cell, or we could have five or six people in a cell. But we try to make it as micro as possible. You don't want to have it company-wide, because they can't control, you know, if you're in the laser cell, you can't control the wire forming cell. They're over there, you're over here, you can control your little part of the world. Right. The beauty of this is, if every little cell does well, the whole company does well, right? If every little micro battle is won, we're gonna win the war. So the company is healthier. All right. So uh, Kelly, what about your compensation? Any any interesting wrinkles there? So 
And it's actually, uh, we do have skill sets, which I think is interesting. We don't put ours up on the wall. That is kind of cool. Um, you wouldn't put them on the wall anyway. You'd put them on the screen, wouldn't you? We would probably put them on a screen, or we'd probably hang them from little, we have license plates at our desks. And so um, skill sets do have little badges. Um, yeah. And we're, we've had kind of a physical badge for years with, that people put on their lanyards. Um, but we're actually moving to a badge, more of a badging system. Um, like uh, open badges and that sort of thing. Um, we do not have any incentive pay. Um, everything is base rate. Uh, we are a production environment. If you think about a call center, it is very much a production environment. Um, but we actually uh, approach it from a different from a different angle. Uh, we have a a good pay, base pay. Um, they start at eleven dollars an hour um, during training, and after that, they go up to thirteen dollars an hour. And then the skill sets that they can acquire. The average salary for a phones rep um, is running around sixteen fifty an hour right now. Okay, and that's because that's the skill sets that they're getting. And it's much like whether you're using them right now or not, you're getting you know you're getting paid for that skill set. You're paid for what you can do for us. Um, we also then have added to that. There's a very robust benefits package, which for um, call center work is very unusual, and that's another, it, that actually is, well, it's, it's it, about 30% of people's, uh, of, of their mm -hmm. their. What, what's the average age of your? your um, the average age is 33, okay. uh, company wide. So that also includes tech and, and, and mm -hmm. HR and those sorts of things. Um, but what we have found is we have different metrics that we look for, and we have chosen to um, explore the engagement from that authority standpoint. Um, a lot of call centers have things like average handle time. If there's a reason that you feel rushed when you call the bank, it's because your bank rep has to get you off the phone in 180 seconds. Okay, um, And it doesn't uh, give the employees and the reps an opportunity to really solve problems. And again, that, the feeling of, that, of the authority is the empowerment. So we look at things like, hey, we want you to spend 80% of your time in a customer-facing capacity. Okay, talking to a customer or waiting to talk to a customer. The other twenty percent—that's up to you. Okay, and that. The, so what else could you do? Um, you're putting in notes. Maybe you're just oh. taking a little bit of a break. We want. Um, <laughs> customer service is very, very high, um, high empathy. Okay, mm -hmm. and you're pouring out a lot into people. There are some days you feel like a therapist. Um, people take their shoes seriously, um, so it really is, it is an opportunity for you to, to kind of pull back. We also have an, another 80-20 that we operate on, which is when we schedule out the time, we schedule about 20% of that is slack time for you to take classes, pursue passion projects, and okay. things like that. So when we're talking about the time management, 80-20, 80% customer facing, that is 80% of the 80% that I'm actually scheduled to be taking calls okay. or doing that sort of thing. There is a school of thought, I suspect <coughs> that your HR or your CEO is it, that, that bonuses are not a good idea, that money compensation, money bonuses is, is, is actually not right. There's a guy around here named uh, Dan Pink who's written a couple yeah. of books about that. Um, and there's a lot of controversy about this. Is that basically your your philosophy? So to a certain degree, uh, we we really um, we're big fans of Chip Conley, and, and he talks about Maslow's hierarchy of mm -hmm. needs, and really that once people once you've reached all of your needs and some of your wants, money becomes less of a motivating factor. Um, and we do have opportunities for people to grow through skill sets and through progression, because we think that the idea of perceived progress and, and perceived control is more important in many cases than just money. But that only happens if you're paying enough that people right. can afford to live. Okay, now I'm gonna, this is a politically incorrect question. Most of your line employees men? Most of your line employees women? Um, yes, slight, slight majority. Okay. Slightly so slightly women. just think about something about a testosterone and competition. Uh, and whether certain people are more motivated by competition with other people um, than we, we have other females people. on the team that are happy to accept the checks. Oh, I <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I reject that. I mean, I think I think yeah, you know right. people people are uh, professionals. They're engaged. They have a target to hit. Uh, they're, they're, they want to bring home more money for their family. They got bills to pay, and uh, I. I uh, in our case, it's working very well. Okay, uh, as I say, there is a very wide difference of opinion in the 
HR community about this. Uh, what, 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 what about your compensation? So, you know, when we uh, first started with the, the test clinic, the beta site, it created a compensation challenge for us that we had to solve. And we didn't anticipate it in advance like we probably should have. But we started out uh, paying the MAs what the MAs were earning, medical assistants, what they were earning in the other clinics. And yet they were asked to do a lot more and they were asked to learn a lot uh, of new different skills. And so we actually had to come up with a matrix like uh, what Drew described where once the MAs were doing phlebotomy routinely and had been trained for that, they earned a little bit more per hour. Uh, once they learned the receptionist skills, they earned more per hour for that. Uh, once uh, they uh, were able to do limited x-rays, for example, they learned, they earned more for that. And, and so little by little, they all started earning more than the other clinics MAs did. And that, it, it created some interest in the other clinics because they started hearing about this. <laughs> and uh, in the beginning when we rolled out the model, you know, some of the MAs actually wept, you know, because they thought, how am I going to learn all these things? And they had notebooks and uh, they, they were they, little manuals that they were carrying around in their uh, lab jackets and trying to remember passwords and all kinds of different things like that. But then other people started getting interested in it and they weren't so hesitant to, to take on the skills because they learned that they were earning more money to do these things. But now that the model has been rolled out to all of the clinics, um, there's just a, a set amount again per MA per hour that they make uh, because they're all expected to do all the skills. So they're, they're all paid more than they were before. We don't have a bonus program. It, it's kind of hard in medicine to do that. Um, you know, it, it, when you incentivize things in medicine, sometimes you get unwanted results. Like if we were paying more to the MAs for signing people up to get their colonoscopies, they might start doing it inappropriately and you get extra tests that don't need to be done. Uh, but we do have recognition programs where we recognize them for doing a good job. And there's this thing called the, the circle of distinction where medical assistants that are constantly meeting their goals and providing excellent patient service uh, get to go on uh, a lunch with the leadership of the clinic and, and they, they share with the leadership all of the wonderful things they're doing and how they're doing them and this information is gleaned and then inserted back into the training program to try and improve things for everybody. I'll tell you one thing by the way on my experience when I went to the basically to the good clinic <laughs> the, the medical assistant gave me her card and I could actually call her number or email her. Email in medicine, you know, is a very new thing. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't email doctors, God forbid. But, uh, but I could email her and call her and she took care of things. And it was, it was uh, but when she gave me the card, I was so impressed, you know, that she had her card. And uh, I, I thought that was a great idea. If you come see me, you can email me. That'd be you can? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, now, final question that uh, is a little less appropriate uh, for you. Uh, so let me start with you. Let's talk about <laughs> the trade-off between heavy investments in training and recruitment um, and bonuses of some sort or incentive pay versus profitability. Now, in your case, you're a nonprofit, but let's just say versus mm -hmm. not losing money, like $20 million a year. Um, do you have, do you feel that there is a tension there? And do you feel if you've resolved it in a certain way, what would you say to the others in your industry who resolve it differently than you? So we were worried that there would be a tension there when we started, um, when we hired these medical assistants and train them to do extra things. And one of the things that's interesting too is that since we're working in teams, instead of being paired one to one, just one medical provider for one MA, we ended up with a higher ratio, more like two to one, two medical assistants per provider in the clinic. And so we were worried that it was gonna increase our cost quite a bit, but we decided, they, they gave us the leeway to experiment with this anyway in the test clinic. But one of the things that we found out, it was very interesting, um, as we went forward with this model, the medical assistants were doing the phlebotomy, they were doing the x-rays, so we didn't have to pay a lab tech to sit there 
you know, 60% of the time and maybe dry labs 40% of the time. We didn't have to pay our radiology tech to maybe take x-rays 20% of the time and sit there 80% of the time. If something needed to be done, an MA would just take them over there, do it, and then come back. So we were only paying someone to do those things when they needed to be done. So even though we were paying the MAs more, overall as a clinic, we were paying less for staff. And so the, the staff cost per visit actually went down when we went to this model. So that was something that we hadn't totally anticipated beforehand. Did it, did it improve doctor productivity? I'm sorry to use these very business-like words, yeah, but did it, improve doc too. Does it, does it did, did it improve doctor uh, pro uh, productivity? So yeah, they, you know, they measured this kind of stuff with us and it, and it makes, uh, we don't like it as doctors, to be honest, but they measure this kind of stuff with us all the time. And so the visits per hour in the clinics where this was rolled out either stayed the same or went up. So some of the, the clinics were actually seeing more patients per hour. Some were seeing about the same. Um, but the, the way that, one of the ways they measure productivity with us is, is something called the relative value unit or the RVU. And based on how complicated the visit is, you get more points, so to speak. And, and how they judge how complex the visit is is based on how much you write in the chart about what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I know it sounds kind of weird to think about So like that's that. higher reimbursements, right? So the reimbursements went up because the medical assistants were putting in these standard questionnaires for every visit. When I was in a hurry before, sometimes I would leave stuff out. I hate to admit that, but you know, you, you get going really fast and, and maybe even though the patients tell you things, you don't have time to write it all down. And, and if it's not written down, it didn't happen, you know, according to the billers and the coders. And so you make less per visit. So. The, the reimbursement actually did go up with this model. So we were investing more in the staff, but then it, it paid off in the end. So in a business sense, we would say your productivity went up, even though yeah. uh, because, <laughs> because it's adjusted for revenue. And a mm -hmm. business would say your productivity went up. You're not a business, so OK. Now let's go to the, <laughs> now let's go to the uh, two businesses. And what about uh, the, the trade-off between profitability and invest, upfront investment? And uh, what is it? that your competitors don't get? So I think, yes, there's a tension. I would definitely say there's, there's a tension that's felt. Um, I don't think that we feel it. I think that outside, um, outside feels it. Um, the big thing for us is that we are a full margin retailer. And when I think of, our, of Zappos competitors, we're competing with brick and mortar mostly, OK? There is not, there, there's not a, a, a whole lot of uh, full margin retail out there on the on the web, and I think that the, the biggest tension for us is is really um, kind of training our customers um, to understand that we are a retailer, we are not a discounter. People think, oh, all, automatically they think, oh, it's, it's online, it should be discount, and that so that helps that that helps to kind of answer that tension for us. But really, ultimately, what it, what it is for us is creating those great experiences for our customers. It means that seventy five percent of our sales are from repeat customers, and that. Of the 25% or so who are new, 40% hear about us from a friend, or indicate that they've heard about us from a friend or family member. Mm -hmm. So when it comes from a profitability standpoint, we see it because we, we believe that creating those great employee experiences enables employees to create great customer experiences, which brings customers back. Um, we are... We were privately held for many, for many years. Uh, we were purchased in 2009 by Amazon. Um, which is a publicly traded company. Um, but not but profitable. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. The timing of this, the timing of this panel. However, <laughs> uh, tough call the other day. Um, we both work for Jeff Bezos, actually. <laughs> um, and we however, don't make any money either, but. I, I can say that Zappos has been profitable since 2008. Okay, um, and we are profitable, um, and we want to be profitable. We want to be, um, we want to be Amazon's favorite, you know, investment. We want to be their favorite subsidiary. Um, so we can, you can be profitable and answer these things. There are some trade-offs, and one of the things is we're not a discounter, and that's one of the things that we have to know is we have to recognize who our customers are, and what is balancing the really the the, the tension is really balancing. What do our customers want? Make sure we're creating an experience that we're giving value to our customers so our customers feel comfortable paying for it. I suspect if yours was a Harvard Business School case, the professor would say, 
you spend more on this customer service experience, which involves training and recruitment, but you spend less on customer acquisition because it comes in much easier. It, absolutely. In fact, we have very, very small, small marketing budget compared to, you know, compared to other companies our size. And, and it really, that's the tension for us. So the reason that we're happy to be part of the Amazon family is it shields us from that because if we were just strictly, if we had gone the IPO route, uh, which was a possibility for us back in 2009 when we were looking, we, mm -hmm. we needed to leave the nest from Sequoia Capital. They were ready to, for us to be on our own. Um, we would have a harder time talking to shareholders about, well, we're investing in our employees because it is very much a long-term thing. And mm -hmm. a Amazon is, a, is that, that's aligned to Amazon's view. Which is why Amazon it's is a very long term. <laughs> it's a great deal. The answer is it is on sale. <laughs> the answer is it's a great deal. Uh, investing in your people, over investing in your people, is a fabulous return on investment. Um, when I first bought the company, uh, we were revenue was sixty thousand dollars per employee. In the first half of this year, we were over a quarter million dollars per employee. Um, so. Uh, we spend 5% of our employee salary is uh, training, which is a tremendous amount. Most of my competitors are less than a half a percent or 5%. That's an incredible uh, number. And it, in the United States, it's gone down to about what you said. It's less than 1% now. That's, I think that's short-sighted. And I think that's a mistake because you want to have the best talent running that million dollar machine or, or dealing with that wonderful prospect. You want to have a, a coherent, intelligent... So when you go to the National Association of Manufacturers meetings or whatever meetings you go to, uh, uh, and you tell this story to other manufacturers who have been had it drilled into them that their employees are a variable cost, that you want to outsource as much as possible to other countries or to temp agencies, that you want to drive down um, personnel costs, uh, uh, labor costs, as much as possible. When you tell them their story, what do they say to you back? See, that's the fundamental difference, is that I think every employee is a fixed cost. They're like a mortgage payment. Okay, they're like, you know, a, a, a rent payment. You, you're going to pay the rent, right. period. So then it's the question okay. of how to get so the best out of them. Right. Since every one of my employees are fixed costs, yeah. they're given, they're not variable. You know, when times are bad, we don't let them go. When times are up, you know, we're not going to float them around like this. If you treat them like that, then what's going to happen is they're more dedicated, more engaged, you're going to watch your back. And if they're a fixed cost, you want them to be really well trained because they're there with they're right. th they're with you forever. So what do the other guys tell you when you tell them this story? I bet they say, "Oh, but that won't work with us." Is that what they say? They won't work in my company or my industry. You don't understand. Is that, is that what they say? I, um, you know, I, I it's uh, it doesn't work for me. Uh, my I, I, I don't get I can't get my arms around it. I mean, don't you want the best talent right. working on your side? But what do they say to you? Well, they're trying to control costs. You know, they're, you know, it's a cost center. Okay, employees are a cost center, and if I can drive down my uh, uh, headcount, they'll use words like headcount. Right. Then uh, and they uh, and and the costs associated with those heads. Right. Then we're going to have more profit. But that's short-sighted, because I think if you have great talent, they'll come up with innovative ideas and they'll be able to push the machines harder than anybody else. They'll be able to solve problems that the clients come up with, and you'll be a layup for reorders, as you were describing. So I I, I reject that thesis. Mm -hmm. Employees employees should be thought of as a fixed cost, and if you start with that paradigm, if that's your context, then you want to train the heck out of them because you're going to have them for 20 years, 30 years. Okay. So now we're going to um, open it up for questions. Uh, please, um, I'm just going to uh, just tell you that I am a, a vicious moderator. So you can have one comment or question, not two, and not three, uh, and uh, just get over the clearing of your throat stuff so you just can say it <laughs> concisely. No clearing of throats. Um, and tell us who, uh, tell us your name, and if it's relevant, tell us where you're from so we know where you're coming from. Yes, ma'am. Carol. I'm Carol Wayman with Congressman Ellison. My question is about when you do training, one of the things that employers say is that, that training walks out the door and goes to another job. And we've heard a lot about non-compete requirements in... Thank you. 
Um, we've heard a lot about non-compete requirements lately with Jimmy John's and some others, franchises that require that. Do you have such kind of non-compete or do you do anything to that you think restricts employees that you've trained to leave for other jobs? J Jimmy John's, the, the sandwich maker? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Non compete? Yep. Yeah. For making sandwiches? <laughs> it's freaking fast. <laughs> well, yeah, flip, that, flip that on its head. So think about the, the other of the alternative strategy. So I'm not going to train my people at all, and they'll stay with me. Do you really want that person to stay with you? I mean, that, that doesn't know anything? You know? You want, you want to have really smart people. Yeah. So, and, and what is your turnover, by the way? We, we we have very low well, we have very low turnover and uh, you know it's it's less than the twenty percent that we were talking about at lunch. Um, what happens is we train people in the beginning uh, and we keep them on as temps initially for the first five hundred twenty hours and we evaluate them and if they are our kind of people then we bring them on full time. Any anyone else want to talk about about the, the, you know you train them and they walk out the door so why would you do that that's the classic explanation of why it's it's their fault not our fault if they, if they wouldn't leave then we would train them you know we, we've started to think about uh, the medical assistant job a little bit more as a pass through position now before it was an end of the line end of the road job where people would come and they would be MAs for 10 15 years or so uh, or, or possibly leave and go somewhere else. But now, uh, we're, we're getting more highly motivated people now that more is required of them and more is expected of them and the training is better. And so we're getting a lot of people now that will work for us for a year or two and then get into like our scholarship program for nursing school where they can uh, work towards nursing school and be a medical assistant at the same time. Uh, and then we've had a couple that have gone on to become uh, nurse practitioners. Uh, we had one that ended up going to M uh, MBA school afterwards and became a clinic manager. Um, we've had med students come through where they get off cycle with their med school training and they have to take several months off before they can get back in in a new semester. Uh, because really, the way we're, we're set up now, it's almost like doing an extended med student rotation where they're shadowing a, a physician for months on end and learning a lot of things. And so we're, we're seeing it more as a pass-through position. And what we're hoping is that a lot of them will stay with our organization. I know once they get those uh, nursing school scholarships, there actually is a requirement that they have to get a job with the University of Utah for a year or two afterwards and many of them just stay. So, this, Carol, I think the answer to, in some way, your question is, is virtuous and, and, and vicious circles. You can either get yourself into the vicious circle where you have less and less training and shorter and shorter tenures, or you can create a virtuous circle where you get more and more training and longer and longer ten. They keep the two things keep feeding on each other, um, either in one direction I mean, or the other. If you see your company dumping money into training you, you're more inclined to stay. Mm -hmm. You're more inclined to, and you, you find the job more interesting. You're doing more compelling things, and, and it's like a magnet to keep you. Yeah, and I think having a pipeline is important. Half of our jobs are filled internally. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Hello, I'm Mal Caravati with the American Federation of Teachers. Uh, you all talk about training once you've gotten employees. What about the educational background and the skills as you hire people? Have you looked at that at all? Is there anything that you can tell us about what kind of people you're looking for? Well, your question is uh, having to do with the, the skills that people come to you when they apply, and what's your question about that? What kind of educational background are you looking for? Do, have you looked for specific kids, say, who come from uh, co community college mm -hmm. or career and technical education, or Kay. do you have any educational requirements Kelly, for hiring people? Kelly, why don't you take that, because you have yeah. some interesting... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, there is, there are, there's very little um, requirement as far as education, or as far as an educational requirement for most jobs at Zappos. Um, even if you wanted to be a software developer, we do not require um, you to have um, any sort of university training. We do require competency in the language and that sort of thing. Um, what's interesting is we do have a fair number of folks who do have, who are college educated, um, who have, for whatever reason, for one reason or another, come into the service industry. Maybe they fell into it like I did because I was an art major, and guess what? <laughs> it's not really. Yeah, that's not really <laughs> something that has huge career prospects. Um, but then 
kind of discovering and giving them an opportunity to kind of carve their own paths. We do not have that requirement. And, and interestingly enough, I think part of the reason we have the requirement is um, Tony Shea, our CEO, um, who has an Ivy League education, has, uh, has very famously said to, to any parent who will ask him, um, don't make your kids go to college, give them that money. He wanted his parents to just give them that money to start a business. Um, so it's not, it's interesting, while we invest heavily in education in our area, in you know, secondary education, post-secondary education is not a requirement for most jobs in our organization. Um, okay, yes ma'am. I'll go to this side. Thanks. Um, I'm Elise Jen Backer. I'm with the National Governors Association. Um, federally, there's a lot of emphasis right now on apprenticeship, and some of the elements of the training you're talking about sounds like apprenticeship, increased wage gains, you know, set wage gains, with set skills gains. I'm wondering if that was a model you considered um, when you considered, you know, either in-house or um, also partnerships with other providers for training. Um, and can I just ask, are you, in your mind, are you talking about sort of college apprenticeships or at that at that age level is that what you're talking about um, registered apprenticeships or uh, you know depending maybe not technically registered apprenticeships anything from you know one to four years they're pretty flexible now there's emphasis it with that federal emphasis on apprenticeship um, I think it's moving towards a broader understanding okay. of what apprenticeship is anyone want to comment on we have very specific uh, machines, lasers, and punches. So we use our vendors primarily uh, to teach us how to teach our team how to operate the machines. Uh, so they'll fly out to Connecticut for a week for laser school, and then a couple weeks later for advanced laser school. So that's that's how we handle. We don't have uh, like a local community college that we team up with in that way. Uh, regarding the the other question, uh, STEM is a big problem. Um, you know, we're in, we're in Baltimore City, uh, in the inner city. And uh, we need STEM talent uh, very badly. You need to know how to, uh, what a radii is, a, a tangent is, a cosine is. Uh, you need to know what a sixteenth of an inch is. Uh, these are things that our schools have to teach, and they're not doing it, and it's very bad. And we need help. Uh, schools are critical to our success. Um, anyone else have any experience with apprenticeships? We actually have internal, we call them Z apprenticeships because we put Zs on things. Um, and um, if you're going to apply for an internal job, um, e almost everything, I think there's maybe like a handful of occasions where you would go directly into that job, but you almost always go into a 90 days apprenticeship. And um, to, we keep your previous department, we keep that head count. Sorry. <laughs> we keep that head count open so your job is held for you. And at the end of that 90 days, on either side, if, it's, if, if you don't really have the passion for it and you want to go back to your other job, no harm, no foul. You tried something new and you probably developed some new relationships and you're bringing things back to your old job. Or if maybe it's just, you know, maybe your skills aren't quite there yet and you can go back or you would continue into that. So we actually use that a, a loose um, interpretation of an apprenticeship model for all of our internal postings. Yes, ma'am. Um, can we talk a little bit about cultural fit? If you because know, everybody says Zappos has got this down. Uh, I've talked to a lot of uh, companies, customer-centric companies in Missouri, about what makes for successful new hires, and they say personality, basic attitudes and behaviors, and cultural fit, cultural fit, cultural fit. So how do those of us who are helping prepare successful new workers help them learn to gauge cultural fit? Um, it's one of the things, actually, I, I'm super passionate about this. You need to understand, if you're going to join an organization, I don't care if it's a job or a synagogue or a church or a civic organization, you need to understand what the values are of that organization. And when we're talking about culture, we're looking for behaviors, traits, and characteristics. So for us, it, for anyone coming to Zappos, it's, we make it pretty easy. I mean, we have a white paper, and we have 10 core values, and we unpack all of those 10 core values, and we're looking for those behaviors, and we interview based on those behaviors, and we give feedback based on those behaviors. So it is a part of what we're doing. So anyone who's going out into the, into the world I, I just do your research. Find out what this organization is, is, is all about. Also, I think it would be great if in schools, um, if schools would talk about what your personal core values are, what your personal values are. Um, I think we a lot of times think in terms of family and all those things, but um, uh, 
uh, tribal leadership, and Dave Logan has a great um, activity that he does. It's kind of a peaks and valleys, and it helps you identify what are the things that are important. Like for me, I know it is important that I feel like I'm contributing to my to my family. I need to feel productive. I also need to have my creative muscles exercised on a regular basis. I need to feel like um, I can be in relationship with coworkers. Interestingly enough, I don't really care if the work I'm doing is um, incredibly meaningful, evidently, according to my <laughs> personal <laughs> core values. Uh, the work it do itself doesn't matter to me as much. To some people, the work itself is incredibly important. So I think, it's, I think it, as educators, if anytime you can help um, your, your, your students and, and all the, everyone coming into kind of become a little bit more, um, have a higher emotional IQ, I guess, really, and, and be more self-aware. And self-aware. Yeah. Because your question seemed to imply, is there some way we can prepare them so we can, for your culture, and what she's saying back is, you know, a lot of this has to do with personality types, and it's not a question of preparing someone for my culture, it's uh, do they fit or not. Um, and are they paying attention? It's important just to know to pay attention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, Walmart has a culture too. It's not like Zappos culture, yeah. but it attracts a different kind of people. And if you say, "Gee, I like a lot of uh, autonomy, and I, you know, I don't follow rules so much," you know, that, that that'll be the end of you. Right. Uh, uh, and that's their culture. It, obviously, it but it's works. Very strong. It works for them, and it works for their customers, apparently. So, um, but it doesn't mean that one's necessarily better than the other, and that you have to, you know, you can't prepare. You could not prepare prepare a student for both cultures. No. It's just not possible. I mean, if, if they're screening correctly, you will not be, at least one of them will reject you, right? So um, it's, sometimes it's not a question of preparation. We have one more time for one more question. Okay. Oh, yes, ma'am. Way back there. A little shy, a little hesitant. Stand up. <laughs> um, Karen Shulman, National Women's Law Center. Um, what are your employees' work schedules like and how much control do they have over them? So we, we have a pretty variable work schedule at, at a clinic. We have extended hours and so we have shifts that, that begin at 7.30 and some of them go till 9 at night. And so they, they sign up for different shifts, but having some control over that has been crucial to try and keep people happy. And so we try to make that as flexible as possible uh, and, and give them as much input as we can. Some of them want to work at night, some of them want to work in the morning. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it, unfortunately in healthcare it does tend to be fairly variable. Are you 24-7, Kelly? We are 24-7 um, and employees bid. We have uh, mass floor-wide shift bid three times a year. So one of the things that based seems on to be based on seniority and one of the things that seems to work out is what's a great shift for me is not necessarily a great shift for you and um, while you may not get your first choice of shift um, I've never seen anyone leaving in tears um, but we also give if we're going to make a change um, we want to give at least three weeks notice um, if we have to do that when we're doing our floor right shift we give about two months notice so people can make changes in their care situations usually we're 24 hours a day uh, five days a week and two days a week were um, 12 hours a day. Yeah. Really? You're 24? And uh, do people want to work the graveyard shift? We pay them a lot more. Uh, the, weekend, <laughs> the weekend shift works three days, 12, they, they work 12 hours a day, three days a week, and get paid 40 hours. And then because they work in the graveyard shift, uh, they get a, a significant bump for that as well. Huh. Okay, uh, we have time. Is there one other hand there? Yes, ma'am. Um, how many weeks vacation do you get? And um, how many weeks sick leave do people get? Uh, okay, uh, why don't you start, Kelly? Um, uh, vacation, they get 12 days and um, five days of sick, and they can roll that over to up, up to 80 hours of sick and 160 of vacation. Either, either the others of you? Yeah, based on you know, how long you've been there, it's two weeks paid vacation, uh, out to six weeks paid vacation. And what was the other question? Sick leave. Sick, sick leave. Uh, we, we have a plan where it's like, you know, you can take either vacation or, or uh, sick. And it accrues. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and for me, you know, to be honest, I, I don't remember exactly since I don't manage the MAs directly, um, but it's the standard university benefits package. I, I think it's pretty good. They get... Uh, Summers off, you mean? No. 
<laughs> it's not that good. It's just you. No, it's just me. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you all. Thank you for uh, a great panel, and thank you all for coming. I just wanted to say thank you all for coming. We'll have more. Uh, I think our next event is in early December. Please watch for that and hope you'll join us again. Thank you.